on? I think it's not so much that, although I think there's an element of that to it. First of all, on the huge success, they still have an output per capita that's probably a third to a half of Taiwan's. So the direction is good, but the level is still nothing to write home about. Right. Secondly, I think that they have done it by specializing in industries which are manufacturing industries, and it's a manufacturing export-driven economy, that are going to get automated. If you go into a Japanese factory today, I mean, and this is the problem with Japan, there are more people on the loading dock than there are in the factory, and the loading dock is this service function that you talked about with Caterpillar and so on. There is no evidence yet that they've moved into developing a vibrant, innovative service sector. And there is equally, I think, little evidence that they've actually developed leading edge manufacturing compared to the Japanese. They've done better at the low end than anybody expected, but they're not the star manufacturing companies that the Japanese are. And a lot of good that's done the Japanese. And I think the third and most important thing is what you're talking about, that ultimately to support a standard of living that's high in this environment, you not only have to have a service infrastructure, but you have to produce intellectual capital. And the striking thing about the Japanese is they did not produce great universities. And I don't see any evidence that the Chinese are producing great universities either, because the truth is, and this is related, I think, to the political system, that the very best graduates who come to the United States, and a lot of them come, all want to stay here. Still. Of course. Wouldn't you? <laughs> and you talk to them and you say, you want to go back to China? And they say, not if I can help it. So uh, does that mean India has an advantage over China in the sense that they're I more mind-oriented? I the, think not there to are. Not the rule of law. I think there are two reasons. I mean, we're, first is that they are much more service-oriented, and I think that's going to help them. They're not committed to doing the kind of sort of mindless manufacturing that the Chinese are doing or blindly pursuing that alley. And secondly, I think that yes, the politically vibrant uh, culture that's there is going to make a big difference. On the other hand. If you look back 70 to 80 years, the dominant universities in the world are today are the dominant universities then. So I think India is not going to necessarily succeed in displacing the great American and the few great uh, European universities. But the Indians ultimately want to go back in a way that the Chinese don't necessarily want, want to. And uh, talking about Europe, why is Western Europe in such a laggard? I mean. They, they should have been at the forefront of the... Again, I think that there are two reasons for that, and they're exactly the reasons we've talked about. I mean, that in a sense, the future is services, mm -hmm. which are locally produced and consumed, and production of intellectual capital. And those are both state-dominated sectors. And they have not produced successful universities because they have egalitarian overlays on things that mitigate against the kind of excellence that you have at Oxford and Cambridge and in the U.S. universities. So they haven't been producing the kind of intellectual capital they need to produce. And it's not so clear that they're going to be good at that. And the second thing is that services and the big services are, of course, education, medical care, and housing are government dominated, either on with very tight uh, zoning restrictions or they're directly run by the government. And I don't think that helps you. So uh, quickly looking at uh, the, the U.S., if uh, we want to continue to be a real leader, shouldn't we be going the opposite direction on health care, opening it up to entrepreneurs and uh, get, get, get a real rip in uh, innovation and production and like we do everywhere else? I mean, I, of course I think that's true. I mean, and, I, and I, if I can say something about the United States, because I think it's important, there are in the world two basic ways you control human behavior and have societies function. One is material incentives, and that includes obviously not just money, but you know all sorts of material sanctions. And the other is social incentives. And the U.S. is an economy that has been selected for not having social incentives, because if you were an Italian and you didn't like the social restrictions in your village, you came to the United States to do well. And what that's done is created a culture, because you don't have to enforce norm obedience in the schools the way they do in Europe, that is a wonderful culture. I mean, in the United States, you can screw up till you're 35 years old. And if you're hardworking enough and smart enough at that point, you'll do well. In France, or in Germany, or in England, or in Japan, or in China, if you screw up by 19, 
and in France don't get into a con deco, you're finished for life. And there is no equivalent of Animal House or the huge literature on high school and college experience in the United States, both in films and books in Europe. I mean, school is a grim experience in Europe. And I think that it is so, uh, that attribute of U.S. society that we don't want to kill in so, any dimension. Uh, e even though a lot of our, especially inner city schools, mess up, if the kids are playing games, their mind develops? It's not just that. I mean, there, look, there are people who develop at 15. I mean, there are people, there's a famous investor called Seth Klarman. I knew him when he was an MBA student at Harvard. He was the same then, he was as capable then, he was as brilliant then as he is today. He developed very early in life. But there are other people who develop much later in life. They develop not at 15, but at 20, at 25, at 30, at 35. And I think trying to force everybody into a European mold where if you aren't doing well by 19, we're going to write you off as crazy. I mean, I would let those people out of school and let them come back to school later. It's funny. I talked to somebody here who started out. She left home at 16 to be a rock star. And she tried that for four years. And then she went to NYU and obviously did well. And she works for you now as a journalist. That is not possible in Europe. And I think that's one of the glories of the United States that you want to make sure is not eliminated by trying to pursue a European model of service and welfare provision. I mean, there's a downside to it, but I think there's a wonderful upside to it. Bruce, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Good, good way to end. <laughs>